It does. Okay. So we're 11.15, so I think we'll get started because I'm nervous as hell. I don't know about these guys. <laughs> Wait, so, uh, someone's been advertising all year for this or yeah. something like that. I don't know what happened. Last year it was 10 people in the room. Now it's like this amount. So it's, it's pretty amazing. So, uh, Jon, will you do the introduction? Sure. So this is supposed to be Sizing the Beast 2017 edition, but I couldn't use the same title, so I, I, I used this really long planning and scaling and sizing and maintaining title. But really, Veeam is just getting bigger, right? And last year I had a picture of a Star Wars deployment. This year I'm a little bit less original, a monster truck. So um, I think we'll start with introductions. So, um, Preben. Yeah, I, I'll start out. Uh, I'm Preben. Uh, I actually used to work at Beam together with these guys. Uh, I just started my own company a couple of months back. Um, yeah, so in my own company, I basically do Beam consulting uh, along with basically all the other stuff I did in Beam as well. Right. Okay. So no change, but a different thing. Okay, so my name is Timothy De Wien. I'm a system engineer for the Benelux area, so Belgium. Uh, I'm mostly known inside Veeam for making a lot of scripting, right? So I try to automate everything. And I guess a lot of people know me from the restore point simulator, so that's uh, my main thing at Veeam. Okay. Right, and I'm Johan, I'm an automation and integration architect uh, for Veeam in North America. Um, I do kind of what Timothy does, my title's a bit weird, and I don't really know what I do anymore. Um, but effectively, I build random things that customers want and help people figure out how you can build on top of Veeam. And a lot of that means service providers, but large customers also. So today's session is going to be about um, sizing and planning and maintaining and how you kind of do that for VBR. And it, we're covering Veeam 1 and MP off really quickly at the beginning, so I've talked about it, but we're not going to spend much time there. Um, there's some tools, of course, we're going to discuss and how would you plan for growth and um, what kind of things can you do to make this kind of setup easier and how do you follow best practices, I guess, because Preben helped write a lot of the best practices. We maybe added a little bit, but Preben did most of that, right? Um, in this case, there's a lot of European guys that helped as well. So for Veeam 1, um, I really want to refer you back to actually a spreadsheet that's available online. Um, the things that matter most because of it being a database, Veeam 1 collects data from your VMware, your Hyper-V, and your Veeam backup and replication environments, right? So the database is pretty key. Of course, making sure there is enough throughput available so that you can have data go into the database on time is a big part of it also. Um, so cluster information, host information, VM, object counts, those kinds of things are important. The idea that you can have an advanced versus a typical deployment, that's really the noisiness of the data that goes into the database. So depending on how noisy your data or you allow your data to get, um, the more data you collect, right? So this actually changes the granularity on the deployment so that you have your data collected a little bit less frequently. And then the SQL reporting service, if you deploy that differently, then by default it comes with a rather weird configuration, which doesn't really use the SQL reporter that much. Um, if you change that, it'll make SQL performance better. Um, there's a knowledge base article up there as well, and that pretty much is everything that this says on the slide to some extent. So that's me covering Veeam 1 off. At the end, we'll, if you have questions about this, I mean, there's a lot more you could go into depth on this topic alone. There's a few sessions on this that go into much, much more detail, which um, you can attend later, um, or you can ask questions at the end. There's Veeam MP, and the same story there. There is a list of metrics that matter, and the metrics that matter, there's a resource kit available when you install Veeam MP. It comes part of the ISO. There's a spreadsheet there that you can use to help calculate how big your data warehouse is going to grow. And um, of course, this also impacts not only the database growth, but VeeamMP has collectors, so that means you can then scale VeeamMP by adding more collectors. Um, that really is it for Veeam 1 and MP today. So I wanted to get that out of the way. Um, Veeam backup and replication is going to be the main focus. So we're going to talk about various things that have been built and we do and things you can maybe use to help plan deploying um, VBR. Um, for starters, what you need to do is get sizing data, right? You can use RV tools or you could use something else. I don't care what you use, but you need to have some kind of information that the customer's environments or your environments um, 
give you. So say that you have 10,000 VMs. How big are those VMs? What are they doing? And how are you planning to grow over time? Effectively, you can answer this question sort of, I have 20 terabytes of data or two petabytes of data, but it's better to get a more accurate pic picture because that helps you plan for the future, especially if you're thinking about five or 10 years down the line as to how much data will I have on disk. And all of these kinds of source bits of data will determine all the decisions later on, which they will discuss, as to what you're going to actually do to, um, to implement Theme. So this is a tool I wrote. It's a very basic tool still, um, but it'll be available afterwards for download um, on Veeam Hub. Um, I haven't uploaded it yet, but I will give you the source code. I will not give you the compiled version, and there are reasons for that. But you can come talk to me about that afterwards. So I'm going to demo this. Um, it's very basic. Um, effectively, all it does is collect a little bit of env environment data. So you start this tool. It's about 8 meg. There's a big difference here is that effectively, what it does is it doesn't have any dependencies. So you can go on to your site and click next, next, next without really anything else. And over time, we'll add a lot more stuff to this. This is not a product. This is just a kind of helpful little tool. This is not intended to replace anything. This is only a tool to help get some initial data. If you want detailed planning, best practices data over time, you're going to use Veeam 1. Yes? So it automatically finds my vCenters here already. It doesn't always. There are some cases where it doesn't, but usually it does. And it will find automatically other parts of your environment as well, but those aren't implemented here yet. And I click Next because it already knows that I have single sign-on ability, so I can just authenticate this way. And this is very basic, but it gives you a very quick picture of what you have in your environment so that you can make some simple decisions as to what you should do next. It's not our VTools yet. And will it be? I don't know. All right. Here we go. It's almost done. There we go. So now we press finish. Now what this does is it actually cheats. It uses a little web service, and it pulls up something sort of like this. Now remember, this is not an official Veeam tool. So this is sort of on our community project site that we have that people like us will commit to, but also people from outside from the community will commit to. And this helps us deal with certain things where you don't need R&D involvement, but you might need to build something. It's sort of a cross between flings and the forums, if you, if you, if you, if you get what I mean. Um, so this is a, a picture of your environment. This is 28 terabytes in this environment. This will run in environments of thousands of VMs. But when we're done, it sort of looks like this, right? And I'll add some search to it in the future also. But what it does then at the end is give you a very brief picture of what you would do to deploy Veeam. And the math behind all of this and a lot more will be discussed later on. So this is a little bit about how you would get this data. You can get this from RV tools as well, and that would be just fine. All right. So that's it from me. Um, let me switch back to the slide deck. Um, there are some future plans. Um, so I want to have it do a little bit of Veeam backup and replication reporting as well. And if you have questions, requests, et cetera, let me know. We can talk about that afterwards. Uh, again, the idea is this is not replacing anything. This is just a little tool to be helpful. All right. Database sizing. Yeah, thanks, Johan. Um, so this pretty much explains why I, why I left Veeam, because now I'm completely redundant, because this was what I spent 80% of my time talking to customers about. So just getting this information about how you can actually size, size your environment. So it's an extremely helpful tool, this one. That's cool. um, so what is not included in the environment analyzer right now is also these additional con considerations about what uh, other components that are, uh, that are inside Veeam Backup Replication. And a very critical component here is obviously the database. So Veeam Backup Replication relies 100% on in a SQL Server database. So when you install the, the software, it ships out of the box with a, with a, uh, with a SQL Server Express version 2012 uh, and the recent service pack. So actually there is some, uh, there, there are some advice that you should actually be utilizing SQL Server 2014 because that will give you better performance and there, there are some reasons for not, not bundling that with the installer because it simply turned out that uh, the unattended install of SQL Server 2014 was very unreliable. So if you, install, if you ever install Veeam uh, out of the, just by next, next, next deployment type of thing, 
then you might actually experience that the UI will become a bit more responsive and so on if you if you go ahead and upgrade that instance of SQL Server Express to a 2014 edition. <coughs> so when does it actually make sense to uh, replace that SQL Server Express with a full version of SQL Server? That is typically in larger environments where you have more than more than 500 VMs. So there are some limitations to SQL Server Express, and the most critical one is the fact that it only uses one CPU. So it can use one CPU with multiple cores, but it will only utilize that one CPU. And those limitations are obviously removed in, in the licensed versions of, uh, of SQL Server. And also, if you want to, for instance, encrypt the underlying configuration database, then you also have the requirements to go to SQL Server Enterprise and so on. So in previous versions of Beam, there was actually also a requirement if you needed to restore databases that were larger than these 10 gigabytes that are also a limitation in SQL Server Express. That is now mitigated by, uh, by the feature that's called a staging, you can configure a staging server. So it means that actually any running instance of SQL Server in the, in the environment, you can utilize that as this so-called staging server, which gives you the ability to dive very, uh, into the, the actual tables and do item level recovery from, from SharePoint and so on. So if you have large, uh, large databases, you would need to have this external SQL server or upgrade the instance that Beam backup replication is running on top of. So moving on a bit from, from the underlying configuration database, um, I'm just going to touch a bit on how um, the proxies and, and, uh, and the repositories actually work. So proxies and repositories can be configured uh, with a number of tasks that they can process. So a task in Veeam language is a virtual machine disk. So that is either a VMDK file or a VHDX if it's a Hyper-V environment. So again, if you ever install Veeam out of the box, the default proxy server will be configured to two tasks. And the general recommendation is that you would configure one task per available CPU core. So if you have a multi-core or multi-core multi processor, you would bump that up to match the number of cores that are available in the system. So for each task, there is started in uh, a so-called Beam agent. So Beam agent.exe, that's the name of the process in either source mode or target mode. The source mode is the proxy. Proxy as a source reads from the production infrastructure and that will send to the so-called target agent, also called the repository. So the repository is, uh, acts as a receiver for that data that is read by the proxy. So in larger environments, it can get fairly complicated to control how the traffic flows in the environment. This is actually a feature that was implemented in Beam Backup Replication 9.5 that it is now possible to control with a feature called Proxy Affinity exactly which proxies or which source agents are allowed to send to a specific receiver. So as we scale out infrastructures, obviously we need to add multiple proxies and multiple repositories and typically this is achieved by using, using some sort of pod development deployment method. So obviously when you, need, when, when you buy storage, it needs to be attached to some sort of server. And typically on that server, we also install the proxy. And then to optimize how that data flows, you want to keep the source and the target agent running on that same server. So we can really optimize the data flow and avoid the proxy from part number one shipping its data to the receiver on part number three, for instance. So if you have a larger environment with multiple proxies and multiple repositories, you might be able to heavily optimize the flow of the data by configuring this so-called proxy affinity. With, with this pod method, um, we leverage the so-called distributed architecture as well, um, which means that simply you would run the backup and replic Sorry. <laughs> the backup replication server as a virtual machine, and also maybe on the same box or on a separate, uh, separate VM, you would run that configuration database. Um, because that also gives you the possibility to protect those virtual machines. Where, where does that sound come from? No? Okay. Uh, yeah, so you can actually protect those uh, components, those uh, managing components by simply backing them up or replicating them as well. 
because the pods themselves are relatively stateless. It means that they can easily be redeployed as long as the underlying storage is still available. Another thing to mention here is that if you're still on Windows Server 2008 uh, for some of the proxy components that you have in the infrastructure, it means that you, you're probably not getting the full throughput that is available that, that can be processed by these proxies. And that is because since Windows Server 2012, Microsoft implemented a feature that provides the ability for components run or services running on the same machine to utilize shared memory rather than the loopback interface of, of, of that machine. So it means that instead of using a TCP loopback interface, it will actually just exchange the data using shared memory, which is much, much, much faster. So if you have proxies running on 2008 R2, it's maybe a good time, maybe a good idea to start planning for how you can upgrade those to at least 2012 R2 or even better 2016. So how do we figure out how many proxies we need? Well, obviously we need to first run something such as the environment analyzer to figure out how much data do we actually need to protect. So the overall data size obviously uh, tells us how much, um, how much needs to be processed by these so-called source agents or proxy servers. And the backup window tells us exactly how fast do we need to process this. So that's really just calculating megabytes per second that we need to, uh, that we need to process. So some customers, they like to size for a backup window of, let's say, eight hours uh, for a full backup. So that obviously gives you a higher requirement for how much throughput you would need. But most customers these days, they actually size for just processing incremental backups within this, uh, this window, and then they would allow a full backup to actually exceed that window. But either way, it's very easy that we actually now change this uh, calculation method, calculation method for just advising you to size for 100 megabytes per second per CPU core for a full backup or 25 megabytes per second per CPU core if it's an incremental backup. So simply divide that uh, megabyte, uh, that amount of data with this throughput number and you would figure out how many, how many cores of CPU that you would need. And for practical reasons, then you can, might want to run this on virtual machines if you want multiple smaller ones or you could buy bigger beefy physical boxes with, uh, with, much more CPU, uh, with many more CPU cores in a single box. Every CPU core uh, should be uh, provisioned with two gigabytes of available memory because that source agent will ob obviously consume some RAM. And then if you go with a, this pod deployment method, then you would also need to put on top of that four gigabytes of RAM per uh, repository uh, task or per repository agent that is running. So moving on from uh, proxies uh, and repositories to some extent uh, to the van accelerator. And um, this is probably one of the most common questions that I've had uh, during, during my time at Veeam. Um, it is when is it actually a good idea, first of all, to use the Van Accelerator and how much resource does it actually require? So, first questions first. Um, it actually, it typically makes sense if you have 50 megabits per second or less, um, if you really want to optimize um, how quickly you can move data from A to B. If it's, so for, for larger, for, for higher bandwidth links, it still makes sense to use the Van Accelerator if you really just, if you, for instance, pay for the amount of traffic that you move across. So this could be if you try to pull data between, between two clouds, for instance, where you pay for egress traffic, then it's not necessarily about saving um, or optimizing the, 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 the throughput that you can achieve, but actually saving the amount of data that goes across that wire. It's really important to understand that uh, the Van Accelerator um, trades CP, uh, compute resources for bandwidth. So it does require quite a lot of CPUs, uh, quite a lot of CPU, and also quite uh, a high amount of RAM. So the absolute minimum s system requirements, even stated in the user guide, is eight gigabytes of RAM. And I've seen so many times where this is actually misconfigured and people try to start out with, let's say, two gigs of RAM or four gigs of RAM because they're not moving a lot of data across the wire. But this will really for cause it to simply crash. 
So it doesn't make much sense to give it more than eight gigs of RAM, but it really needs those eight gigs of RAM per van accelerator. Um, so out of the box, if, if you transfer data with a copy job or just writing to a, to a repository, you would achieve something like 2x compression. But if you uh, move data through the van accelerator instead, you would achieve something like 5x or more. Uh, so 5x is a, uh, is a safe number, and, um, and this is what you can really use for sizing exercises. So just like the restore point simulator, uh, Timothy also created this bandwidth simulator, which you can use just to get a, uh, a rough ballpark figure uh, about how much bandwidth you actually need. Oh. Did I break it? Still doesn't work? No? When we get to a fun demo, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's back. <laughs> Looks like a Windows 10 bug. <laughs> oh, so this, yeah, so this is better. Yeah, so just um, a quick demo of this tool is that um, what is really important to type in here is the the amount of data that you actually consume. So not provision space, not the capacity that you have available, but the actual use space. So this again is really where this environment analyzer that Johan demonstrated before comes in extremely handy because you can really easily tell how much you actually have uh, used in the infrastructure. So in, uh, in most environments you have somewhere in between five and 10% change rate, and if we change this to a 5x compression, we can see that we really reduce the amount of bandwidth that we need to actually transfer this across the wire. So this is really where uh, you would see a big difference from, uh, from using the van accelerator. So the link is in the slide as well, which you will get after the session. So that's all for me. Okay, Moving thanks. On to so I'll talk about the restore, restore point simulator today. Okay, well, I don't really need that. So uh, before I started at Veeam, we actually had a very interesting formula that was given on the forums, and basically nobody understood how the formula worked, right? So I created this tool, but I do want to highlight the formula because it's actually the basics of the tool, and it will make you better understand the result of the tool itself. So when you start thinking about backup sizing, the first thing that is important, of course, is the full data set that you have. So let's assume you have 10 terabyte. What we do is we compress it with some kind of zip algorithm. And we compress it down to, let's say, the half of it, 5 terabyte. So in the formula, so from 10 to 5 terabyte. So if you see the formula, you'll see that there's data that's representing that 10 terabyte. And then C, which is a compression factor. And so for us, when we talk about the compression factor, we don't say 2x or 3x or 4x. Because if you would multiply that, that would be, get bigger, right? So the compression factor is in percentages. 50% uh, would mean 2x. So we go from 10 terabyte to 5 terabyte. And that's a fair, let's say, compression reduction factor is 50%. Then, of course, the next day, you're probably not going to run a full backup every day. So you're going to make an incremental backup. So what you take is you take the incremental data. And how big is that? Well, it's the data set multiplied by a factor D. And that D factor is actually the delta factor, as we already saw in the one accelerator. Uh, it's about between 5 and 10% is what we use typically. Now, I'm going to talk about that factor a bit later, because we have a lot of discussions with customers saying, OK, I have 1% of uh, delta. Probably that's not true, right? Because we back up at the block size and not at the file level. But again, I'll show you a bit later uh, some cool insights about that. So now we have one full backup, one increment. So we have one data and one delta data multiplied by the compression factor because we also compress the VIB file. But probably you want to have more restore points. And this is where it gets tricky. You have to multiply by the amount of fulls and the amount of increments. 
So a lot of people said, okay, that's great, but I don't know how many fools I have. I don't know how many increments I have. Especially if you're a new customer, maybe you don't know how Veeam works out of the box. So that's why one, it's not working yet, so, so I'll, I'll, anyway, I don't have a lot of slides, so once we get the demo working. Once we get the lab up, it'll be. <laughs> okay, sorry for that, guys. So uh, RPS, Dewin.me is probably, so my name is Dewin because I'm European, right? But uh, you can write it Dewan or something like this in English. Uh, and uh, this is actually the alpha version. So I'm going to present the alpha version. Uh, you'll soon figure out why it's the alpha version as well. It has those nice red banners, uh, but know that the, the regular one is being used and being validated by a lot of users, so it should be fairly uh, good. So if you look at, for example, a forever incremental, uh, let's say we take this example that we had before. So 10 terabyte, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but what you can do is, and a lot of people don't know this, is you can just put in 10T. So if you have a customer that says 50T, don't have to calculate how much that is. You just put in 10T, you go to another field, and it's going to calculate for you how much that is. Uh, the same if a customer says, okay, I want to have, for example, uh, four weeks of retention, and your basic math skills are a bit out of whack after all those years. You can just put in 4W, and then it's going to convert that to 28, right? Uh, so the change rate, we discussed that. That's on a 10%. I know a lot of my colleagues are sizing with 5%, which is being called the optimistic value. Uh, but I'm going for the conservative value. And then the data left after reduction, we discussed it as well, is 50%, like 2x. So when you run in a forever incremental and you say 28 points, what you expect is probably one full and then 27 increments. So it, it sizes that for you, right? It's, it's really easy. Now, the math on this one is really easy. Uh, by the way, Preben talked about processing speed. If you want to know the processing speed, you can click the number as well. Not a lot of people are aware of this, but it will give you the throughput speed of that amount of data, uh, uncompressed and compressed. So you get both values. Uh, and then deciding what is your backup window uh, like. Where it gets more trickier is that uh, the default configuration of a job is not a forever incremental, but a synthetic fool. So we had tons of people saying, okay, I configured 28 points, right? Uh, but when I run the backup, uh, I see that Veeam is actually not deleting stuff because I have more than uh, 28 points on disk. And the reason why that is is because uh, well, the restore point simulator actually calculates the worst case simulation. So it's really a, a simulator because it really tries to run through every day and make an assessment what backup and re replication would do at that specific day. So that's why, by the way, the GFS part takes forever because it needs to run through five years of processing, let's say. So, but what you see here is I put in 28 points, and what you can see is that, oh, I'm just gonna try to hide it here, but you can see that the 28 point at the top is, uh, is an incremental point. So it's dependent on the complete chain. And that's why Veeam backup and replication has to keep more points just to get the retention going. So this is, might be very trivial, but we had a lot of customers saying, OK, you know, a weekly fool that consumes a lot of space. You know what? I'm going to switch to an active fool every month. And then I'm going to like save a lot, right? Because I only have one fool every month, right? But for example, if you would do that on a chain of 12 points, and you simulate that, and that's the nice thing, so you can simulate it, you can see that it has to keep a lot more data, right? Because worst case scenario, this 12 point is uh, dependent on a complete month of backups. So I think that's the, the, the fun part about the restore point simulator is also just going there. And it's not only about sizing. It was never designed to be a sizing tool, but of course, that's what it ended up to be. Uh, but just to play around and just to see, okay, in advance, what will be the result. Uh, another thing which is what I like about it, which uh, asked a lot of work, is the GFS part. So at Veeam, uh, when you look at the optimal configuration, what we recommend is that you back up first to a very fast tier. Let's just say just a bunch of disks, maybe with 14 points, maybe with 28 points. Doesn't really matter what, what I define like your up, up operational restore window, let's say. 95% of your restore should come from this first tier. And the reason is why you want to do stuff like instant VM recovery, which requires a lot of IOPS, but also sure backup and so on. 
requires a lot of IAPS to do the fast recovery, right? So for long time retention, you can use the backup copy job. And I see a lot of new customers struggling with this. They're like, how do I configure uh, weeklies, monthlies, quarterlies, and yearlies? And typically what you do is you back up to a first tier and then to a second tier. And on the backup copy job itself, so this is the same in the GUI, you can configure uh, the weeklies, the monthlies, and the yearlies. So you can simulate that here as well. And uh, what is interesting about this one is uh, a lot of people would say, okay, if I have six weeklies, uh, 12 monthlies, uh, eight quarterlies, and three yearlies, I would have, okay, let's see if my math is okay, uh, would have around 29 points, right? And that's not really true. I remember we had discussions with Preben, how can you present this on a slide tech? It's impossible. That's not really true. And the reason is quite uh, obvious if once you understand this. is, for example, you see here this weekly, and I, I realize it's a bit small, but I'm just going to read it. It's just saying two weeklies, one monthly, one quarterly, and one yearly. So this one restore point is not only representing the weekly, but is also representing the monthly, the quarterly, and the yearly backup. Uh, that's a hell to configure by the, or to code, uh, to figure out when that is. But why is that? Imagine you say, okay, the weekly has to be done on the Saturday. The monthly has to do, be done the first Saturday. The quarterly has to be done the first uh, Saturday of the quarter. Then it's just basically the same restore point. So uh, you can do the rough calculation, but this is going to give you a more accurate view. Where it really gets fun is when you uh, have a customer that says, okay, we grow every year. 20%, uh, what would be a uh, good sizing for that for the, four, the next three years? So uh, that's exactly what the restore point simulator can do. Well, it's an alpha, so let's see. Okay, maybe I just didn't click it hard enough. Uh, and this actually gives you very interesting results because uh, I remember this one, we had a customer and we had to size it. And what we did basically is we took the data set did the compound interest rate, like uh, let's say in three years, the total volume of data will be that, and then all the full backups will be that size. But that's incorrect, right? Because if you start today, the data size is gonna be smaller, and this is where uh, RPS can help a lot, is because it's gonna tell you, okay, uh, after three years, the full backup is gonna be eight terabyte, but three years ago, at the very beginning, today, it's only going to be about 5.5 terabyte, right? Because the data set is smaller. Right? So this is giving you a more realistic uh, view of how the data will grow. Finally, a lot of people have asked me, can we export this? You can actually export it. So if you do this export here and you click simulate and just redoing it, uh, it's generating a link here. You can copy paste that and then basically if you run that, it just, well, I try but, no, cannot close that right here. So if you run that, it's just gonna rerun the simulation again. So if you want to pass stuff to your colleague or I don't know, uh, well, okay. Uh, it's just doing the same simulation. If, for example, you want to include it in some kind of presentation or in some kind of, um, let's say, Word document that you wanna send out to a customer or you wanna keep, you can use this canvas rendering, it's something new. Uh, basically in HTML5, there is some new tool that calls Canvas. And what you can do is you can draw on it with JavaScript because this is completely based in JavaScript. Uh, and then you can actually download the PNG. So you don't have to snapshot it. You just click this download PNG. It creates the PNG and then you can import that in your Word document. So you get your sizing on the fly uh, going. Uh, important, it only works with Chrome and Firefox, maybe with Safari as well, because uh, it's some kind of attribute that is not in the HTML standards yet. And, well, you know how browsers like to follow standards, right? So, uh, okay, so I'm gonna try to get back to the presentation here. Uh, okay, no, that's fine. So I'm gonna skip these slides, but that's okay. Uh, so the change rate, I do wanna talk about the change rate. Let's see. Because once I start talking, right, it's like. So, change rate is a really interesting topic because a lot of people have questioned me about this. So, uh, change block tracking, to, should we not use 1% or 2%? Is 5 or 10% not really high for a change rate? And the reality is, it's not for Veeam. 
So what we actually do is we use VMware CBT or we use Hyper-V uh, RCT in the recent release in 2016. So for if you have 2012, by the way, we have our own filter driver for that. But in the end, we do our own uh, layer on top of that. What we do is we take the disk and we divide it in one megabyte block sizes. This is actually the default. So you can go to a job configuration. If any of you have already played with backup and replication, you know local target. That means that we actually divide the disk in one megabyte part. If you go to one target, it's only 256 kilobytes. So if you add a new file, uh, what most file systems try to do is, is to write sequentially to the disk. So if you write, for example, I'm, I'm going to say here uh, two files of, uh, well, two blocks of one megabyte and then something like three and a half, what will happen is when we do the backup, we actually have to backup around six megabyte because that counts as a full block. So in most cases that works. So in most cases, what changes we really only back that up. But if, for example, you have a SQL server that does very small changes, like one kilobyte block sizes, you will see that the change rate is much higher. And the reason why is each of those one kilobyte changes is flagging one megabyte of block, right? So that means that instead of five kilobytes, we have to back up five megabytes. So still after this explanation last year, we still had a lot of comments on this. So this year, uh, during one of my uh, creative periods, I created a tool uh, which is called Chain Block, uh, well, CBT Query. Uh, and it works for VMware only, I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's, it's really rough, so I only distribute the source code, but if you want to have a compiled version, I can send it to you. But it's more like a resource tool, right? And uh, what it does is it, it visualizes change block tracking, right? So it does a visualization of the blocks that have changed. So I use this to actually, uh, well, follow a backup process going and see if that matches. And for example, when you think about an NTFS format, a lot of people would say, okay, when you format the vol volume, you don't have to back up anything, right? Well, in reality, you do, because when you format the volume, it's going to create the MFT, which is the, the metadata, is the M it's actually the metadata for NTFS, so you need that to know where your files are, right? It's like the index of uh, the file system itself. So already, when we're just formatting the volume, this is a two gigabyte volume, uh, we can see, and I, I changed the block size to uh, one target, 256. So already you have to back up 12 megabytes and you're not storing anything. Okay, so what happens when we add 100 megabyte? Just one file, 100 megabyte. So what NTFS tries to do is to make it sequential stream. That's what you can see here going on. And so we put 100 megabyte, we have to back up 102 megabyte. Why? There are some small green blocks there. That's the metadata that's being up updated actually. So that's fine. You add a bit of more files, let's say four files of 25 megabyte. Again, NTFS tries to make it as sequential as possible. Now what if we delete a file? Well, nothing really happens. Some metadata update, but the original blocks, uh, they don't have to be backup because they are not changed. They are not scrapped. What is important is we had uh, a file of 100 megabyte and then a file of 25 megabyte. And so what, it, what happens when you add a file of 250 megabytes? Is NTFS gonna split up the data to reuse the original blocks? Or is it gonna keep it one fragment? So to my surprise, actually NTFS does a good job. It keeps it all together, or it tries to do that, so that it always writes sequentially to the drive. And so this one megabyte block size, it really makes sense because NTFS in the end tries to make sequential writes and tries to keep the data together. Now, there are some use cases where you can create change block tracking Christmas, I would say. Uh, and that's actually a, a couple of, of our users have already run into this. So if, for example, your database is updating, you can see this kind of behavior happening because uh, it's modifying very small blocks all over the place. Uh, and we have to back up more. Database reorganizing, exchange reorganizing, reorganizing, oh my god. And then uh, one of my favorites, a lot of customers uh, love deduplication in a VM. If you run 2012, 2016 deduplication in a VM, uh, what happens is that sometimes customers experience that on Saturday, for example, all of a the sudden there's a lot of data that needs to be backed up, and they say, well, nothing is really happening because everybody's at home watching Netflix, right? So 
Uh, what actually happens on that volume is a post job is running, it's reorganizing the same data, it's putting pointers, and it's, it's flagging everywhere. Fragmentation, and then of course, this is what actually is generating. What I did here in this test, I wanted to generate fragmentation, but I never get to that point. So what I did here was, every time I run, I'm running this, I'm adding uh, 100 megabytes, but in 4K, block, uh, 4K files. So it's like 128,000 files added every time you see the, the, the GIF uh, changing. And what you see is that the, the files are added very sequentially at the end. But here there's a lot of green happening. And that's just the directory structures being updated. Because if you have uh, random file names, it has to update the directories. And it's just going to, well, directories are just files or B trees. And it has to insert the metadata all over the place. So at the end, we end up with, I believe, around, well, the, the data being added is 100 megabytes. But at the end, the backup is around 300 megabytes. So just to make you aware, don't go for the various, if a customer comes to you, don't go for like 0 0.5 uh, change rate, that's not realistic. We back up at the block size, we do that for very good reasons, because in most situations that, that's perfect, and that's going to be the fastest way, uh, but do take in mind, and we see this a lot on SQL servers, that the change rate can be a bit higher. So. I think 5 to 10% is a realistic configuration. Hopefully, I, I proved to you, to you guys that that's, that has some background to it as well. And then finally, uh, with the release of 9.5, we added ReFS integration. For those who don't know what this ReFS integration is, uh, basically in ReFS in 2016, there is a new API call. And that API call is, well, we refer to it as a block clone API. Uh, well, I have the exact term, but it's, it's not really relevant. What you can do is actually is uh, say to the file system, OK, I have a file, a source file, and I have a target file. And what I want to do is I want to copy a block from one file to another. And what ReFS actually does is it doesn't really copy the block. It just puts a pointer to the original block. From a user perspective, uh, what is the result is that this, the, full, the file looks like a regular file, but underneath ReFS tracks the pointers to the same data, much like a deduplication device. So why is that good? Well, for example, a synthetic fool is basically that. You copy data from original files to a new synthetic fool. So if you do that with the block clone API, not only is it very fast because you just have to put pointers, but you also are getting space savings, right? Because you are referring to the same data. It's not occupying more space on disk. GFS, the standard backup copy job, GFS, uh, is actually uh, doing that as well. It's just copying a file. And if you run that on a ReFS, it's going to help you significantly. Now, uh, a lot of people have asked, can you update the tool? So it also applies for ReFS. Uh, I did that, and that's why I'm showing you the alpha today. Uh, for a synthetic fool, it's, it's quite simple to do that, that sizing, because uh, what you have to realize with a synthetic fool, what we do is we first make an increment, and then based on the increment and the previous chain, we make a synthetic fool. So how big is that synthetic fool going to be? Well, probably the size of the, the data that has changed, the increment itself. So synthetic fool, basically it's easy. The first fool will take all the space. And then the second uh, fools, let's say, in the chain will occupy incremental space. For GFS, it's really tricky. And we really don't know at this particular point. That's the gut on a street truth. We don't know. Uh, Tom Seidler is, is another solution architect in, in uh, Johan's team, uh, who's a very uh, guy who was always telling me, well, if you didn't measure it, you cannot put it in the tool, right? So. Uh, what we did now is in the alpha, and that's why it's alpha, because we didn't measure it yet, is we took three times the change rate for the week, five times the change rate for the month, nine times the change rate for a quarter, and 15 if you have a one-year difference. So you can go to the tool uh, and play with that if you want. So this is the alpha version, like I said. If you take here Synthetic Fool, you have here the ReFS box. Let me disable the... Uh, and also the canvas rendering. Uh, you can see that it has some upgraded graphics. That's fine. But you can see that I uh, took for the full the same size as the incremental. So uh, I, I think that's quite realistic. Uh, 
Where it, again, where it gets tricky is when you go, go to the GFS part. Uh, and let me just run that through. So here you will see that these fools are about one year of difference. So they will be almost the full size because I have a 10% change rate. Uh, but if you go down to the weeklies, they should be three times the incremental size. Now this is purely a guess on some first measurements we did. Uh, so uh, what can we do to improve the guessing? So in truth is we don't know, right? So you have the alpha version, so it's in the slides, so you don't have to make a copy. Uh, but I made a new tool called Blockstat. Uh, you can find it on the win.me slash revs. And it's this tool, let me just demo it quickly uh, and to show you what it does, basically. Um, so I'm gonna start from the very beginning. So let's use it. It's just an, um, a C code, so it's C++, it's compiled. Uh, and you can run it, for example, with slash, slash D and then the directory. And what it does is it takes all the files and it compares how much data is in common. So, for example, here I have a couple of VBK files and it will tell me sharing one. That means it's unique data because there's only one file using this specific data set. 2x means that two files are sharing this amount of data. So basically your saving is one time this. 3x means three files are sharing it, so you get two times 145 uh, savings. And then here you can actually see the total amount of savings. Now why is that important? If you have one chain on, uh, on your ReFS volume, you can just take the total size and see how much space is left and then deduct how much it should use and so on. But if you're, for example, a cloud provider and you want to know which customer is getting the most benefit from ReFS, you can use this on their chains uh, to see where the most space savings uh, is going on. So to give you an example why this would be interesting, if you, for example, take, and uh, what we did here was we configured the job to do a synthetic full every day, right? Because it doesn't matter, it's ReFS, so it's only going to take the space of the increment. Uh, so if you take uh, two fulls that are one day apart, as I'm doing here in this example, you will see that uh, the sharing is very uh, high, so most of the data is shared, uh, and only one, the one X, the unique data in the files is 500 megabytes. Now, uh, to show you that those 3x, 5x are actually not underestimated, I think, or overestimated, I think they are getting actually over underestimated. Yes. Yeah. So I'm being too optimistic, that's what I want to say. Uh, so if you do that for, on a weekly backup, uh, I tried this today, you'll see that we go from 500 megabyte unique data to 3 gigabyte of unique data. So it means that uh, the difference on a weekly is much, much bigger than I actually anticipated in the alpha version. So to just to tell you that the ReFS, uh, we don't know yet, but we have a cool tool, and I would love to get your feedback uh, if you have a production environment. Just run this between two weeklies, monthlies, uh, send me what is the increment size, and send me uh, what is the difference between weeklies or monthlies, so I can adapt the tool and make a better tool for hopefully everybody uh, of you out there. Okay. That's, that's it. That's it. Okay, I'll just do this one as well. So, uh, Johan Preben and me, we are heavily involved in um, a community product which Johan has talked about, it's vimhub.io. We also have a GitHub account, and I'm just, I'm just gonna open it because there are very, a lot of interesting stuff on there. So if you go to GitHub, VimHub, oh, oh yeah, this is QWERTY, right. Uh, you will see that there's a, a kind of a community going on there. Most people on there are employees, but there is also a lot of people that have committed to it that are not Veeam employees. So that it, our idea is not to make it employees only. Our idea is to just collect uh, scripts and useful tools. So one thing that you can see is on there is the best practice guide. Uh, under PowerShell, you have a lot of uh, customers who or users who already made some pre made scripts, so for example, I have here 
uh, the Mimic report script. A lot of people want to have uh, a copy of this report. You get that backup replication. This PowerShell script copies that and so on. So you get a lot of nice features. Uh, one extra tool Johan said just presented quickly <laughs> is uh, one of the first projects is, for example, uh, Super Edit. And what Super Edit does is um, if you have a lot of jobs and you need to configure a certain setting on all of your jobs at the same time, you can download this tool and then, for example, select the jobs you want and then, for example, enable dirty blocks exclusion uh, on all of the jobs at the same time. So just a PowerShell wrapper, but this way you don't have to figure out what is the PowerShell to enable swap file exclusion or to change the compression level or the block size all at once. So we would love that you guys commit to this and uh, add more PowerShell to that so that it can grow as a community. Right? Okay. Yes, so thank you guys very much. I mean, I hope there's some time for questions now. Um, it looks like there is. Um, do you guys have anything you'd like to talk about? If not, I mean, I know this is a huge room, so we can also have you come up afterwards and ask me questions individually. But thank you very much for sticking around. I know the content was heavy in some places and lighter in others. So we appreciate that. And um, yeah, have a, have a great time the rest of your day as well. So any questions? Sure. Okay, so the question is, if we are doing something about the agents yet? Uh, um, well, I don't think we've done very much performance testing. I know R&D has. Um, on our side, not as much. No. Uh, because we haven't seen as much of it being centrally managed. For us, it's very important that if you do something like that, that we have a way to, to track all of that. So, yeah. Exactly. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, it will be available. I think you will be able to even see the recording or something. There will be a recording available as well. Yeah. I'm not sure, but... I know that from far away, for a lot of people, it was just hard to see, so... No worries. <laughs>